Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alberto Neidert, and I'm the head of the European uh, Migration and Diversity Program here at the European Policy Center. And on behalf of the EPC and of Egmont Institute, I would like to welcome you to this hybrid policy dialogue on the new pact on migration and asylum. What's next? I think the number of persons who are present in the room and those connected online uh, speaks to the importance and profound implications of the new pact. Um, uh, we all know that between the past and current legislature, the EU has never been closer to introducing comprehensive reforms to the common uh, European asylum system with the pressure continuing to mount. Um, in June of this year, as I presume you all know, the Council reached an agreement on rules governing the processing of asylum claims and on allocation of responsibility over asylum seekers, but following that over the summer, member states failed to reach a common approach on the crisis and force majeure regulation, which they intended to merge with the instrumentalization proposal. In her State of the Union address, barely two weeks ago, the Commission President von der Leyen ins insisted on the historic opportunity to finalize the new pact. Last week, however, the European Parliament announced the suspension of negotiations on the screening and Eurodac regulations demanding the member states uh, find um, a common approach and overcome their divisions on all files in line with the roadmap signed last September. This is a key juncture and what will happen in the next few weeks is likely going to have a decisive weight on whether the new pact reforms will go ahead or not. And in this context, several vital questions uh, come to mind. Will member states be able to bridge their divisions on the crisis and instrumentalization proposal? And what happens if they don't? Will the European Parliament never agree to abandon the package approach under any circumstances? Or is there an alternative, perhaps setting crisis measures in the proposals on which there is already a common position? If the reforms do go ahead, given their complexity, but also the failure to reach a unanimous consensus in the Council, how will member states, and especially the Commission, ensure that the change rules are probably, pro properly implemented? And most fundamentally, will the EU be able to give itself a better system than the one he has today, creating more a sustainable balance between solidarity and responsibility, restoring trust among member states and confidence in EU citizens? Or given the time pressure, is there a risk of rushing the reforms, watering down fundamental rights obligations and failing to future-proof the EU asylum system right before the next European Parliament elections and many elections at the national level? These are some of the questions that we will try to address uh, in this hybrid policy dialogue today. And we are very delighted to have a fantastic panel and the three uh, institutional representatives or three key voices from the three institutions uh, with us today to help address these questions. With us, we have Nicole de Moore, State Secretary of Belgium for Migration and Asylum. On my right, we have MEP for the Renew Group and Rapporteur on the amended uh, proposals on asylum procedures, Fabien Keller. And then we have uh, the Director General for DG Home, Monique Parian. Um, our sincere thanks for having accepted our invitation despite your busy schedule. Uh, Juan Fernando Lopez Aguilar, MEP from uh, the SD group and chair of the LIBE committee, due to a last minute change to his group calendar, could not be with us today, but he did want his voice heard, so he sent us a video message that we will make sure to play during this event. One word on the program and on housekeeping rules, we will start with a keynote speech from the State Secretary uh, to be followed by the video recorded message and the initial reflections by MEP Fabian Keller and Director General Monique Paria. After these uh, first individual reflections, we will continue uh, with an interactive panel discussion until about 2 p.m. to be followed by half an hour of Q&A with those connected online as well as with those present in the room. Those connected online can already drop their questions uh, on the chat at any point during the event. After the Q&A, final remarks will be provided by Jean-Louis de Brouwer, Director of the European Affairs Program at the Egmont Institute. State Secretary, if you would like to move to the lantern, the floor is yours uh, for about 10 minutes. 
like this. Okay. Well, dear members of the panel and ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to see you here in such a large number. First of all, I want to express my gratitude for being invited to this event today, because in light of the upcoming Belgian presidency of the Council, this is a great opportunity for me to reiterate the importance of the European Asylum and Migration Pact. For more than a decade now, the European Union has been discussing the introduction of a predictable, a sustainable and a fair system for migrants, asylum seekers and refugees. And based on the Commission's 2020 proposals, the various legislative proposals were brought together into a new pact on asylum and migration. Now, this pact offers a comprehensive approach to strengthen and integrate key European policies on international protection, on legal migration and on border management. Of course, Belgium supports the general approach taken in the Pact on Asylum and Migration, including the strong and well-organized management of the external borders and procedures and a predictable solidarity based on fair share principles. We aim for a reform that is thorough and ambitious. Now, I cannot mention enough that this pact is key because the pact will ensure more common management of migration we have to avoid member states passing the challenges to each other. Each member state has to take its responsibility and if the situation so requires, show solidarity with each other. And through the new border procedure, we would quickly distinguish between people fleeing war and violence and those coming to the EU for purely economic reasons. In this way, we would avoid people with no chance of recognition spending years in our asylum system and remaining in the EU without legal residence permit, which often lets them end up in very vulnerable situations. In the coming months, the Union will have a unique opportunity a unique opportunity to make that reform a reality and to finalize the pact. And from January onwards, I will do so in the driver's seat as president of the council dealing with asylum and migration. And I am fully aware, ladies and gentlemen, of the huge responsibility that will rest on our shoulders because now is the time. Now is the time for a united Europe, a united Europe to work on an asylum policy that protects those in need of it and a migration policy that attracts talents to our labor market markets and to our universities and we really have no time to lose there of course this is only what we can do together as european member states this is only half of the story besides this internal dimension of our asylum and migration policy we cannot neglect the external di dimension our relationships with third countries which might be even more sensitive nowadays and quite obviously media and political attention these days often goes to this external dimension and can we or should we have a deal with this or that country how to shape these partnerships with third countries. How do we address root causes? And much has been said about the so-called Tunisia deal, a deal signed by the Commission with a strategic partner. And although the migration part of this deal gets most attention, what the deal is really about is to help Tunisia a country with major problems to build a full-fledged state with economic opportunities for its own people and for migrants. These measures will ensure stability. So in my view, the agreement is about addressing root causes, labor creation, green transition, education. And this is what distinguishes this deal, this partnership from, for example, the 2016 agreement with Turkey. The Memorandum of Understanding with Tunisia goes much broader than mere migration policy. At the same time, I support the pragmatic approach taken so far in our relations with Tunisia. It is important to encourage long-term reforms, but at the same time, we must prevent the country from collapsing in the short term without losing sight of our fundamental values. 
Now, the EU should, in my opinion, dare to look wider and work for integrated partnerships with various third countries, covering more than just migration. We need to establish balanced and sustainable relationships in which migration management is an important but not the only component. And within migration management, it is not only about managing borders, but also about setting up structures for international protection and for returns towards third countries of those without residence permits. To conclude, I cannot stress enough the importance of moving towards a more common European policy on asylum and migration, both in the internal as well as in the external dimension. We need to move towards this common policy. Current events show that these reforms are needed. To take my own country as an example, as you might know, it has been under high pressure since some years, for long periods of time, in fact, since the summer of 2021. And one point I would like to make here is that the crisis we are facing today is different than previous ones, because what we are seeing today is not a peak in demands. It is an elevation that has become the new normal, and this makes durable reforms even more important. And if we don't reach an agreement, each member state will, will fall back on its own. In that case, migration could even threaten European unity. But with an agreement, we show European citizens that we take their concerns seriously that we are stronger together, that we can protect those in need, and that we can organize migration in an organized and a controlled way. And I will therefore do everything possible to reach agreements in the months to come. And so we are at a crossroads, ladies and gentlemen. We have the opportunity to have an impact, both at the European as well as on the national level. But we have a a responsibility to, to European citizens and to migrants and asylum seekers alike, to show that we can do better. That is why I cannot stress enough how important the last couple of months have been, because there truly has been this sense of urgency in the Council around the table with all ministers who realize the enormous responsibility that lies on our shoulders. And that is why I am not afraid to refer to the Council meeting of last June as revolutionary, because it was revolu revolutionary for several reasons. First, when adopting a position on the asylum procedure regulation and the asylum and migration management regulation, the Council did what ministers have been debating for years. It is our lack of an agreement that has made us weak in previous years, weak against smugglers and weak against corrupt regimes. And secondly, and much more importantly, we have found an agreement on a substantive reform of the European asylum system. For the first time ever, there is an agreement among member states on a compulsory border procedure in all European countries. And for the first time, there is an agreement among member states for a compulsory solidarity for the reception and treatment of asylum seekers in the European Union. And of course, we can all say that this is not a perfect deal. That is rarely the case when 27 member states with such divergent interests and geographical positions have to reach agreements on a topic as sensitive as asylum and migration. And yes, the job is not yet finished. The Council position is the basis for negotiations by the Council presidency with the European Parliament. So we are not there yet, but you may have sensed that my expectations for the time to come are rather high. Achieving a substantive reform of our common asylum and migration policy is for me a personal commitment for which I look forward to closely work together with the distinguished members of this panel of this afternoon. It's clear, ladies and gentlemen, we need to find European solutions for European problems. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, State Secretary. We will continue with the video recording of MEP Lopez Aguilar. So this can now be played on the screen.
Hello, good day, European Policy Center, and thank you for gathering us in this conversation about a most interesting matter of our concern as European Parliament lawmaking body. It's the migration and asylum pact. I'm only sorry that I can't make it physically there with all of you because I am attending a group meeting in Madrid precisely with the occasion of the Spanish rotating presidency of the European Union, which is this semester. But I am only thankful that I can right. share with you some thoughts about the state of the play of this new migration and asylum pact. What is it about? We all know it. It's about a situation, a status quo, which is not acceptable. We've been making laws on migration and asylum according to the rules by the Treaty of Lisbon and the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, which entered into force nothing less than 14 years ago. For some years now, we have put in place, or we have tried, a European common asylum system according to the principles on which it is to be founded. Solidarity and responsibility. We want shared responsibility and binding solidarity when needed. Well, we had initiative from the European Commission according to the mandate of President von der Leyen, five regulations trying to bring about a new balance, particularly in those files which have been more subject to criticism, namely Dublin. What is Dublin? Dublin is precisely a regulation which indicates that the country of first entry is the one responsible not only for granting asylum, but all the services and the protection which is entailed to some kind of international protection, subsidiary protection, or refugee status. And then there comes the criticism of secondary movement. And then there comes violations of EU law, ignoring EU law, despite infringement procedures, despite rulings of the European Court of Justice saying otherwise. And yes, there is the lack of solidarity. Yes, there is the missing link in this whole thing. Solidarity is one of the pillars enshrined in Article 80 or Treaty of Functioning of the European Union. We, the European Parliament, we do care about solidarity. That is why when we faced the new five regulations package, we adopted the package approach. They are intertwined. They make sense all together. They depend on each other. So we are not to accept that the council is cutting the pieces of the package according to its own will, at will. So choosing, cherry picking, what is suitable for the interests of some member states, particularly the most reluctant to solidarity, and then leaving the rest of the files aside. No, we adopted the package approach and actually we agreed with the council a roadmap which is precisely a signal of commitment in order to deliver this mandate of the European Parliament 2019-2024. And the clock is ticking. We're coming close to the end of the mandate. And you know what? We are still in the window of opportunity of making it happen. But for that, it takes the Council to move on towards solidarity, show commitment towards solidarity. We are not ready to accept that the Council takes reinforcing the external borders of the European Union, their readmission and returns. We want them dignified, but we are ready to, to, to take into consideration the importance also of readmission and return agreements. We are ready to, to, to deliver on the new rules regarding procedure and regarding asylum and immigration management, regarding screening, which is border procedure, regarding Eurodac, which is identifying who's entering the territory of the European Union, but also we want solidarity in situations of emergency or crisis, as it is called. Yes, binding solidarity, relocation programs, to be given a chance for those member states which are in the front line. Let's say the Met Five, Spain, Malta, Italy, Cyprus, Greece, Spain not only towards the Mediterranean, but also in the Canary Islands forefront in the western coast of Africa, because we're having a peak of irregular migration in the Canary Islands too, which is, yes, simultaneous to the terrible situation in Lampedusa. We hear the cry out, where's Europe when it comes to solidarity? When it's Europe, when it comes to redistributing those human beings in need, where is Europe in order to put in place some coordination of the search and rescue individual operation of the member states? That is exactly the added value of the European Parliament. That is the mandate of the negotiation of the European Parliament in the new Migration and Asylum Pact. And we want the Council moving 
yes, we had some trilogues on the way, but we don't have yet a general approach on the crisis regulation. That is why we are ready to put to a halt all negotiations, all the rest of the files, including Eurodac and screening, unless the council makes up its mind in the crisis regulation, because the component element of solidarity, binding solidarity when needed, articulated by the commission with the EU coordinator for relocations is also a component element of the balance that we want to strike right. We have an opportunity, a window of opportunity to make it right. This mandate of the European Parliament, if we don't make it this year, it won't be believable that we will make it somewhere further up on the road. Any other mandate of the European Parliament? No, the time is now, the opportunity is now. So please help us to bring the Council to the awareness that it takes general approach in all of the files. For that, we engage in negotiations and make it happen in this mandate of the European Parliament. Thank you. And uh, we shall continue with uh, the intervention by Ms. Fabian Keller. Over to you, as agreed, you have six, seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, you have so many speeches, one after the other. <laughs> Did you have lunch? Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> I had half of one. <laughs> a two minutes one. Um, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's such a difficult uh, subject, but it's so important, as you so clearly said it, uh, Mrs. Uh, State Secretary, to find together a solution as European not to solve a problem, because migration is not a problem. It's a reality that is, you know, there in the humanity for centuries. Uh, but we have to uh, take it into account as Europeans, and not, as you say it, I, I wrote your words, not uh, sending the, the, the difficulties from one or member state to the others on the country, um, looking at the challenges uh, together with rules, because we have to have common rules, and humanity, because this is the essence of our, our project. So I will made, make some specific points, because a lot was already said. I must say that I agree to all of what you say, Mrs. Minister. And Juan Ferdano is a friend of mine, as a friend of because he's the chair of the Libby committee, where we have been discussing this for four years now. So I started my job with an um, evaluation uh, mission on Dublin, the most difficult file and the most uh, difficult situations for migrants. And then after the package on, more specifically on APR, the procedure file, and also on Dublin, the success of Dublin, the management of uh, asylum with all the solidarity mechanism with uh, my colleague uh, Thomas Toby. So um, let me do three big remarks. First, uh, as you said, uh, Mr. Mrs. Minister, the first and huge step is to adopt the pact. Uh, we have no, no duty but to take our responsibility and find common agreements between the Parliament and the Council. But when you listen to Juan Fernando, we have troubles with the Council. Our positions are not the same. We adopted our mandate on, in March. This is why the Council was first to be late. Huh? Help them accelerate their decision. Um, the pact is uh, ambitious and very awaited reform of uh, European asylum and migration system. But there is still a lot of work to do. It's a, a set of 10, roughly 10 files. Some of them were already agreed in the previous mandate. Three and a half, four uh, texts are, uh, have been uh, the, the source of a new proposal from the commission. Actually, three, totally new. And the one on the procedures was partly taken as it was, and partly uh, changed. Uh, now the negotiations have started between the Parliament and the Council. And of course, we enter the uh, most difficult part. There are divisions everywhere. 
not only between the institution, but also internally, for example, among the council. You, if you follow this file, you know that Hungary and Poland are on the side because they're very tough to include in any of this text, but even though they accept some of them. Uh, and uh, this issue of crisis, of course, crisis for the council is the most difficult text because it deals with the Syrian situation. What do we do if we have so many people uh, asking for protection in, in Europe? I must say that the parliament is not perfect because we have no mandate on returns. Yeah. And returns is very important, of course, for the council. Um, we have to conclude because after the European election next June, you know the next presidencies, Hungary, Poland, Poland and Denmark. Denmark. So very difficult to work with them on migration issues. Second point, we need clearly efficient procedures and solidarity between the member states. A true reform implies much more efficient and humane procedures. First, it means much faster and uniform procedures uh, for the examination granting of asylum or the appeal. We have to break the current system in which applicants may wait months, if not years, a decision from the authorities. For many of them, they don't have any accommodation, for example, in France. If you are a woman or a family, you, are, you have a housing. If you are a man alone, there is no solution because there are too many people um, now uh, demanding for it. At the same time, efficiency does not contradict with high standards for the protection of applicants' rights and dignity. That's why the European Parliament is insisting on new yet fundamental procedural guarantees. First of all, free legal assistance from the start of the administrative procedures and not just at the appeal stage. It would bring a significant improvement in the quality of decisions and therefore, we believe, reduce the prospects of a zeal, of appeal. Second point concerning the, the guarantees, the special safeguards for unaccompanied minors. They shall not be channeled to a border procedure and member state shall ensure the appointment of a guardian from the very start of the asylum application, somebody representing the young person. And thirdly, we want the creation of a new independent monitoring mechanism of fundamental rights in the pro border procedure and also consistent with the global fundamental right um, monitoring of all the asylum uh, procedures. Regarding uh, the border procedure, it's important for the parliament to make sure that national authorities channel to the border procedure the applicants for whom there is a reasonable prospect for of return in case of a negative decision on asylum. I must say that to achieve um, uh, an agreement on the pact we have created two years ago now, under the French presidency, uh, a new structure that's fairly efficient, where the five presidencies, starting with the French, French, Be Czech, Belgian, Spanish, no, Sweden. French, Sweden, Czech, Sweden, Sweden Spanish, uh, Belgium. Yes. yes. Last but not least, um, and the ten rapporteur and the commission, of course, with yourself, uh, Dominique Paria, and the commissioner. And it's very interesting because we started in June uh, 2022, and we get to know each other, to understand each other. The parliament would say package approach, the parliament, the council would say screening and your act first. And uh, so the discussion was, uh, you know, and we agreed that we make our best efforts to conclude before the end of the mandate of the parliament. And that's something that all the reasonable people around the table really carry in their everyday uh, negotiation, even though we have sometimes, you know, difficult moments. My, my last point after the, the first step is to adopt the pact. Secondly, 
find the balance between procedures and solidarity. Uh, I must say that there are two huge challenges in front of us. One of them being external relations with the countries of origin. The Tunisian the agreement with Tunisia is not acceptable as such, but it was a first try to have an agreement more globally to take in to discuss with the country of economic, educational issues, other issues than migration, but included in it. But we should progress in that direction of uh, discussing, negotiating with the countries of origin. And the second point I will detail a little bit is the implementation. Uh, implementation gaps is one of the main weakness of the current rules on asylum and migration. This new pact must bring strong changes on the ground, not just on the paper. The commission will have a key role in the monitoring of the implementation of new rules and to help member states to meet the objectives. I also consider all our agencies. I think about asylum agency, EUAA. I think about Frontex with their all their coast guards, um, and people who are helping the member states when they uh, take into account a specific situation. I'm thinking about Europol with all the procedures against the smugglers and the necessity of international uh, cooperation. <laughs> they should play an increasing role to support member states on the ground with expertise, human resources, and equipment. I must say that considering EUAA, the asylum agency in Lavalette in Malte, um, I rely a lot on them because I think it's incredible that we have such a discrepancy in the uh, the analysis of individual asylum demands. Uh, so we have many people who are doing two or, or more demands uh, in the different member states. In France, it's 40% of the demands who are a second or more uh, done by the asylum seeker. So it's very inefficient. So I hope that like in universities, we have a, not a European system, but a convergence of our asylum uh, analysis because we share the analysis of the countries of origin. We share our methodology of interviews of uh, the asylum seekers. And we, if we have discrepancy, we try to understand why, because there is a priori, no, no reason for that, no objective reason to reduce it uh, in time. So uh, I, I am totally involved in this, like you too, maybe you too. You, you, okay. We are going to be helped by you. Well, the discussions contribute to the you know, uh, better understanding of people of this package and gives it uh, political value. Uh, when we have the far right uh, saying we have to make a, 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 an embargo uh, naval, how do you call that in English? Uh, a naval uh, blockage. What what are you going to do with the people behind the blockage? I mean, it's not there is no simple solution to this issue, but we can try to better understand it, manage it uh, in a European way. That is applying common rules and with confidence with the member states. So this is in the spirit that we are all working together, together each at his posi her position. And I note that the one who is not there is the man and the three girls as are there. <laughs> no, it's, it's just a bad joke. It's, um, it's a hope and it's important that uh, think tanks like yours are participating to the exchange of ideas and that the pro-Europeans are, are really uh, progressing together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts also and for bringing up to speed also with the negotiations and on implementation questions. I'm sure that we will discuss quite a bit in the minutes to come. And I'm going to uh, immediately hand over uh, to you, Director General, for your reflections. Thank you very much. Difficult to speak after Madame uh, Minister and uh, Fabienne and the chair of the uh, of the Libé Committee. Maybe I, I would like to give you a little bit the perspective of the Commission, uh, but also I, I 
just come back to the title, which says uh, Pact on Migration, what next? So I think there is different uh, appreciation of the next, what is next in the coming weeks, coming months, but also afterwards. So I think uh, it was said by, by both Nicole and, and Fabienne before me, migration is not a, a peak. Migration is something we have to manage. And the very purpose of the pact is that we finally have a system to manage migration. It's not to get rid of migration. It's not to increase migration. It's not to, uh, to uh, decrease migration. It's just to be able to manage it, to manage it in an orderly way. And that's in this spirit that the commission has put these proposals on the table because uh, the previous commission and the previous uh, parliament had not been, and, and council had not been able to reach an agreement on the proposal that was made before, apart from a few ones, which indeed we took over because the pact is, is, is a set of different <coughs> layers, let's say. There, is, there are the proposals that were left on which more or less an agreement was reached, was the qualification directive, the reception condition directive, part of the return directive indeed, and, uh, and the uh, resettlement framework also. But uh, basically the previous commission had failed to, or the pre pre I would say not the commission, the, the all institutions huh, had failed to come an agreement on, on a new migration and asylum system, on new rules on solidarity and responsibility. So that's what we've put on the table in September 2020. There are five regulations. One is uh, to uh, set up a, uh, to improve the system of Eurondac, you know, the system that takes the fingerprint of people that arrive at the border for the moment takes fingerprints of people who ask for asylum. So we wanted to extend it to everybody that arrives at the border so that we have a better tracing of who arrives irregularly at our borders. And then together with that, a system of screening of people that uses Eurodac but goes beyond also is to check everybody in order to be able to make a kind of, of triage of the people at the border. Those who are really in need of protection those who don't want to ask for asylum but are irregular and that should be returned and the rest which would probably be the majority of them that would uh, are unlikely to would want to well, asking asylum but are unlikely to get it that would go into this border procedure border procedure that has been defined in uh, the regulation on the asylum procedures where with, uh, for which Fabienne Keller is the rapporteur, which foresees uh, the, the revised rules on asylum, but also this border procedure. Um, and then the last part, uh, there are two other regulations, a very important one, which is the asylum and migration uh, management regulations, which precisely sets uh, this balance between responsibility and solidarity. On the one hand, uh, establishing revised rules for who is responsible for whom. Uh, well, it's a successor of the Dublin rules, as you know, and uh, also establishes for the first time also a, a mandatory solidarity system, which is not mandatory relocation, but a mandatory solidarity system. So, and then the last proposal is a famous crisis proposal. You may have heard a lot in the last uh, weeks on which we, that was not in the package of the June Council uh, and uh, that was left behind because it was not ready. Uh, at that time, and for which we still have some questions. I'll come back on that. But one thing I would like to emphasize, I, I agree with Minister De Moore that the, the uh, decision in June was historical, because for the first time in seven years, member states were able to find an agreement on a topic that is extremely complicated and extremely sensitive in, in all member states. And I think that's something that we have to underline. And that explains also why we have difficulty on the crisis regulation now, because uh, for the, the, the balance we found in June or the council found in June 
was so thin that there was nearly no space for some countries and some political parties in some countries to go a little extra mile for really crisis situation, like the one we experienced in 2015, 16 with the Syria crisis, but like the one we experience also today in Lampedusa. So it shows that we really need this crisis regulation because uh, we all know that, you know, you can manage as many crises as you want. There will always be one that you have not foreseen. But the more we can foresee and, and plan how to organize and the better procedures we have to, for exceptional situations, the more equipped we will be to face possible other situations. And uh, on that, maybe a little parenthesis on this crisis proposal, we had proposed at the time, because we never used it, uh, to repeal the temporary protection directive. Which I think it's important to underline that today, because uh, that was also the reason why we proposed this crisis proposal at the time, because we thought this TPD has never been used, so we don't need to keep it. For 20 years, nobody used it. Then we had the uh, situation with uh, the war in Ukraine. And then suddenly <coughs> we were in a situation where member states were agreeing to, to uh, activate, because we need a decision of the member oh. states for that, to use the temporary protection directive. Why? Because we were clearly in a situation where we had refugees at our borders fleeing a conflict, a war that needed to be protected. And you've seen the big wave of solidarity, how this TPD has been implemented relatively smoothly. So in the meantime, we will not repeal the Temporary Protection Directive. And this is uh, part of the, uh, the compromise that is currently on the table. Because we also see that in specific situations, it can be used and it, it can be also useful. Uh, on where we are today, so what's next? So you've seen that the parliament has decided to stop the, uh, the negotiations on the screening and Eurodac, uh, at least at political level, until the council gets finds an agreement on the crisis proposal. There are very difficult discussions currently on the in some member states and, and with us also to see how we can square, and this is even more impossible circle to square than the other regulations, so that we still hopefully can get an agreement on the crisis proposal. Uh, if possible, before the Council uh, in October. But uh, I, voilà, that's part of the these challenges we've had to, to deal with. Uh, so I, I keep on hoping this will be feasible. And I I do think that at the end we will we will manage. But it's it's very painful huh? and it's uh, it's very difficult in particular in Germany because actually we have a problem on the crisis proposal because Contrary to the rest of the pact, Germany does not agree on the compromise proposal on the crisis. So that's one of the big problem we have. Uh, and if you know, if we don't have Germany on board, we need a big majority of other member states to support it. And that's also where it is, it is difficult. <laughs> I, I think the parliament has done its job, except on the return directive, if, in, indeed. Uh, we have had so far a number of trilogues uh, among uh, council and, uh, and parliament. We will have an, ex an additional one next week huh, on both uh, on both proposals. So now it's time to work to work on the APR and the MMR. That's really where we put the focus for the moment, and and uh, we all work hard uh, on all sides. Uh, including on the on the Spanish presidency. We have not much time left. Uh, I, I do believe we need to have an agreement before the end of the year, because uh, you know how complicated and sensitive migration is. I don't think no one has an interest to have this interfering too much into the political debate for the next elections in the campaign. So ideally, if we go clock, you know, uh, countdown, uh, 
I my perception is that there should be uh, an agreement on the pact in the plenary in March, but for that we need a political agreement probably not later than uh, end of December, very beginning of, of uh, January, because there's a lot of um, technical work to be done. Uh, we are talking about nine legislative proposals. Uh, and considering the difficulties and the difficulty to, you know, to find the, the right balance among very difficult and, and, and sometimes antagonist positions, be it on the council side, but also within the parliament. Uh, the you know it's not the council on one side, parliament on on the other one. The the balance in the council is is difficult. The balance on the parliament is also at times not not so easy. So it will it will be very challenging. But we need that for the end of the year so that we can do this technical work to look at how you know the inconsistency and be sure that the texts are are safe also and uh, and good enough to be then implemented and then i come to the implementation of it because what is in the proposals is that uh, the pact will uh, come into force or this regulation will be implemented two years after the adoption uh, the, the council has integrated into uh, its compromise uh, and implement the necessity for the commission to come with implementation plans, which we will do if it is adopted, because we will indeed need uh, this time to set up uh, the necessary reception capacities at the border to help member states also to prepare to apply this border procedure. Uh, to set uh, to put in place the monitoring uh, systems for uh, you know make sure that fundamental rights are respected and and that the procedures will be designed as as they should be and implemented so there will be a lot of work uh, to to continue and i think this implementation plan even if they were not foreseen we would have to do them anyway so that will be part of the work for the next commission to prepare uh, on this implementation plan maybe a word because to come back to the what next uh, the pact is managed to is made to deal uh, with uh, people that arrive here regularly at the border, how we deal with that, and then uh, ensure that there is a balance between, you know, the different member states uh, on bearing the burden and on organizing that. But uh, we have to continue to work much more on the external, what we call the external dimension of migration. And migration, by definition, as, is internal and external because it starts somewhere and then arrives in the EU. So we have to continue to work with third countries on addressing the root causes, but also on helping member states of origin, but also of transit to help them manage uh, their migration flows. This is part of what we have in the Tur Tunisian agree uh, Memorandum of Understanding. Tunisia has no asylum system in place. So many of the people that arrive, and most of the people that arrive in Italy are not Tunisians. Some of them, but most of them are from Guinea, from uh, Ivory Coast, from Senegal. And uh, if we could help Tunisia to put in place a, a proper system of managing migration and helping them to return people directly in the countries of origin before they undertake dangerous crossing of the Mediterranean, this would be also something that would overall help the system. And going even further, I think all that will, if we want to reduce the irreg irregular arrivals at uh, to the EU, we need also to work uh, on increasing legal pathways to migration, and in particular, providing uh, uh, work. We have a shortage of labor in Europe, so there are ways to pro to get people to come to to the EU legally. They would be better accepted better integrated. They would also meet our own requirements. I think it has also to be, uh, you know, at the advantage of both sides. And it would reduce also irregular arrivals because people would not need to ask for asylum to get to into the EU, but would have other, other ways to do so. But that's also 
chantier that we are starting with uh, with different proposals, negotiating talent partnership with third countries. Also, we will propose uh, by the end uh, of this year a talent pool, which will be a tool to match uh, demands from the, our countries with possible offers from third countries. So that's another part of the puzzle to 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 manage migration. But uh, I just one more word of conclusion because you said, will it be? Will we have a better system afterwards? I'm absolutely convinced we will have a better system because we will have rules that will apply everywhere in the EU. We will have a predictable uh, solidarity system, which may not be perfect, but we, we, which will be existing. We will have rules to uh, register people at the border to trace them. We have renewed rules in terms of responsibility, which will be more balanced. And uh, at the end of the day, it can only be better than the situation that we have today, which every crisis that be it big one or small one shows that uh, how important it is to have something more predictable. Thank you. Thank you very much also for these initial reflections. So first of all, I would like to ask uh, the State Secretary if she has any response uh, to these reflections. Yeah. Thank you. And um, well, hearing these reflections, uh, I, I become more and more optimist. I, 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 as I mentioned in my keynote, we're not there yet, and we all know this. But if we listen to each other, we see that we we can become more and more optimistic that we we can get the deal done before the end of the legislature uh, we all share the urgency uh, around the table but also when we take a look at the content we are not that far from uh, from each other in uh, in in council and and parliament and we i am convinced that we are able to to find a balance and perhaps the first reaction to something mrs keller said uh, referring to to my keynote uh, when i say we need european solutions for european problems it's not migration that is the problem not at all it is the lack of a functioning migration system that is uh, the problem and i i I can even put it stronger than that. It is the lack of a sufficient uh, functioning uh, migration system that is a, a threat. And it's not migration that is a threat to the European Union, not at all. But the lack of a functioning migration system is a threat because it puts a lot of pressure on the functioning of the European Union and on the functioning of Schengen. At the same time, at the same time, I believe it is an opportunity. We have an opportunity as uh, and we are uh, well we share our belief in europe um it is this is an opportunity for europe to show that we can if we work together find solutions for something which is uh, uh, which is uh, uh, considered as a, a preoccupation in all European member states and for all European citizens. So I do believe uh, the, the challenge we have ahead the coming months is an opportunity for Europe to show its value to uh, European uh, citizens. Um, uh, perhaps one other reaction, as you uh, correctly mentioned, uh, it is really also a matter of harmonization and integration. Um, we need better procedures, we need better functioning first procedures in order to prevent uh, appeal procedures. This is also, in fact, the philosophy we, hand in, in, we have in Belgium now when we are, uh, because we are working on a, on a new legis migration legislation also on a national level, it is really making sure the first procedure is, is better so in order to avoid uh, complicated uh, appeal procedures um, and in this sense solidarity and responsibility go hand in hand and I, I I know this phrase is often used but it's it's because it's true you cannot organize solidarity without for example a better registration at the border so these these do go uh, hand in hand and in in order to 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 see the the need for the more harmonization 
globalization, it's good to, to take a look back to the roots of, of our, our problem. This is the, the, the not functioning asylum system. If we take a look back, it's clear that the root lies in the in the um, uh, co European constitutional reforms in the late 1990s, which in in fact were very important milestones uh, in them from themselves. Uh, for example, the 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 inclusion of the Schengen a key into the treaties, but we we didn't uh, take enough the consequences on our national asylum systems and our secondary movements into account. Uh, simply, the asylum system never went to the same form of integration as other uh, policy domains in Europe, and that's where we uh, we need to catch up on that. We need to catch up. We need. Um, better fun functioning procedures and more equal reception standards and integration perspectives in all uh, European member states. And right now, at this point in time, the integration perspectives and um, reception standards vary uh, too much among member states, causing secondary movements. And secondly, we need also a functioning system in order to counter secondary movements. We do not have such a system uh, today. If we take a look at the statistics in Belgium, half of our asylum applications are done by uh, people who have a status elsewhere in the union or have an asylum uh, procedure elsewhere in the union or have been registered elsewhere in the union. And the other half of them, and this might even be more problematic, has never been registered, although Belgium was not their first country of entrance into the union. So it's clear that this puts a lot of pressure on national uh, systems. And the current mechanism we have there, Dublin is not functioning, first of all, because it's not functioning as a solidarity mechanism. In theory, it puts all the pressure on the member states of first entrance, and it is not uh, functioning as a responsibility mechanism, because we treat a lot of uh, uh, so-called Dublin uh, Dublin uh, files in our country, but only five percent of them, only five percent of them, in fact, leads to uh, transfer to another member state. So Dublin is not functioning. We need another solidarity and responsibility mechanism, which is in the pact. So I, I do believe, as as Monique said, in the pact are the mechanisms which will help us to to control uh, migration and asylum in a in a better way. Um, what is necessary, and 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 in in fact, uh, events like this uh, today help us to do that, is to come to a better understanding of what the pact really is. But because um, politics is also psychology, uh, but this uh, this helps us to find uh, to find agreements. Because what I, what I um, experienced after this revolutionary deal in uh, in June is that in every member state we had uh, a lot of discussions on the pacts, and in every member state we had both sides, both extremes of the uh, of the political spectrum made something of the migration pact that the migration pact is not, and this makes political discussions also very difficult. And I I noticed this when we came back on the the next council in July, and we closed the. Deal in June, and when we saw each other again, the ministers and my colleagues in July, we all uh, shared our experiences, and we all uh, experienced the same, namely that we all uh, ended up in emotional and tense debates in our own country, all of us trying to uh, defend the compromise, because as I mentioned, this is a compromise between 27 or 25 member states with very divergent uh, views, and we need to have the courage to defend compromises and it takes a lot of courage to come to a compromise so we had a lot of courage in june but we will need more courage for the months to come to stick to this deal and to find other deals on the on the instruments that are still uh, left and i saw on the one hand i had to explain that the migration pact does not install a a so-called Rwanda or Australian model or whatever you call it. The pact does not close the borders for those in need of uh, protection. The pact does not include pushbacks. And on the other hand, I had to explain that the pact is it's a bit uh, like... Um, uh, I see again uh, uh, discussions as we had after the closure of the Global Compact on Migration, where you have to explain that the pact is not a pact to 
uh, to make more migration come. It's a pact to organize uh, migration that is a reality. And so it's it's very it's a very tense and, and and often emotional debate that is still going on in different member states. And it's not easy to find political uh, courage and to find compromises in such an emotional debate. So I think it's very good uh, uh, thing that the uh, European Policy Center uh, tries to come to a better understanding altogether. And this will help us in the coming months to find agreements. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to make sure that there is uh, time for Q&A, but I'd be happy to hand over to you, uh, Steel, if you uh, want to respond to these, perhaps adding a couple of questions, because uh, the first, uh, uh, the starting point, as we heard, is uh, setting in place uh, efficient procedures at the border, and you know this file very well. But the other side of the coin is, of course, also making sure that there is uh, solidarity and that there is uh, also mandatory solidarity in some situations. So. Uh, we all know that the uh, APR does place additional responsibilities on member states uh, at the external borders. So it would be important to hear your reflections on what is needed in order to balance these additional responsibilities out. The uh, common approach of the council is rather different. It sets a cap on relocations. Uh, it does uh, put the flexibility uh, on top of these. So it would be uh, important to hear what your reflections are on these, how to strike the right balance. And then the other uh, question for the Director General, uh, we ho heard how important it is to make sure also that the rules are properly enforced. And this is fundamentally a weakness in the current system. On the one hand, Devising a better system is in itself going to help with this problem, but we also need to make sure that the rules are adequately enforced. And it would be important to hear uh, how the Commission intends to approach this question in the future, since it's also a what's next question. So over to you for uh, perhaps brief remarks on this so that we have time also for the Q&A. So it's my fault if you don't have time to ask questions, right? Oh no, we will have time for, for the questions. We will take uh, Concerning, so how, how find the balance? First of all, it's very difficult because on one hand, you have what everybody sees, whatever system is living in each member state versus what might be, might happen in case the package would be implemented, which is fairly theoretical. We don't see all the same things behind. So it's very difficult to balance. So I can tell you the reality today. I went with Juan Fernando, who is former president of the region of the Canarian island. I went there and then there I learned a lot of things because we have people coming from the Moroccan coast, the Sahara Occidental with boats, fishermen who lost their fishery rights, sold to Chinese and who are traveling with people who are paid by smugglers huh, to transport people, Senegalese, Moroccans, Mauritanians, to the Canarian Islands. And there, a lot of people arrived. That was two years ago. They are still arriving a lot in those days. Huh? And then they tend to take other boats and, and planes to go to the rest of Spain, because we are in, the, in Schengen when you are in the Canarian Islands. And a judge, very involved there, very experienced, told me what is happening here is solidaridad discreta. We don't register, so we are not in charge of people. Because anyway, the 25,000 people who are in the Canary Islands, nobody is going to help us. No, no other member states. So the right way to manage it is to let them go through. Some of them stay in Spain, but most go in Belgium, Netherlands, France, Germany, where there are jobs. This is not the way we want to manage migration uh, in the future, we want Spain to register, but not leave them alone with all those people. There are too many. It's a, an issue, and we have to discuss with the Americans, Senegalese, Mauritanians, why what's happening, what are the Coast Guards doing, why are those people fleeing, how can Senegalese come through legal migration, as you explained, etc. But we're totally in another system where the first point is confidence between the member state. If there is a solidarity mechanism, it's going to be applied. No one really worked until here, until today. 
we are building a totally new, brand new system. And I, as you said, it's very psychologist. Mm -hmm. Do we believe in it? Do we really want to do it? Do we really want to you know, share the constraints, but also the opportunities? And because it's our honor, because it's uh, collectively more efficient. I did, I spent one year at the beginning of my mandate to make an implementation report on Dublin. Dublin is just doesn't work. <laughs> Dublin, I am uh, inv involved in the two files procedure and AMMR, that's the successor of Dublin. So the two ones that are very sensitive and the way they are applied is going to define globally the, the, the way the system works. Uh, it does not work at all. So if we forget it about having these references because it's horrible. No take charge. Take charge is trying to send the person back to the country of first century because um, the, this was supposed to be the country where the person would ask for asylum. But the issue is we're in the Schengen area. So there are few controls at the frontiers. So a lot of people are take back, but they come back to the original country. So even if the 5% are applied, it's not very, very efficient because probably they are in Belgium because they, they have some families, for example, able to give them accommodation, very important. And if they are elsewhere in France or Italy, or they don't have that. So they tend to try to come back. So it's a... I think it's we discovered that in the temporary uh, directive, um, the application, it, there are um, human will. It's tough to go totally against because it's very you cannot decide in in the place of all the people. So we have to be pragmatic, but in the way we manage it, we have to be confident. France or Germany on Spain on Italy, on the way this is managed, and the countries of first century, of course, called the MET5, who consider they have all the burden today, and they are going tomorrow, because they have the procedure at the frontier. They have to rely on the global system also. So this is why I, I don't know how the council can take that into account, but I think all this, the infrastructure due to the procedures at the frontier must be financed 100% by Europe, because they are not doing it for Italy, for Spain, for Greece, or Malta or Cyprus. They are doing it for the um, consistency of all the migration system in, in Europe. And they have already the difficulties due to the fact that, you know, I was mayor of Strasbourg. No one wants a big infrastructure like this in near his village. So it's already an, an effort for local authorities. So this is the, my view, but it's very long to explain. It took me five minutes. So um, when you have people from the far right saying uh, they want to overflow uh, Europe with migrants, look in Lampedusa, you have more migrants than people living there. What they are trying to put in the mind of people is that you know the, the number of people coming in are huge, huge as many people as the inhabitants of a city or a country. So uh, we need our help, intellectual help, <laughs> to see what the new organization could be and how we, this would mean better consideration for the people, for the migrants themselves. They are not procedures. They are people trying to find their way in uh, our world. Thank you. Thank you also for putting the question on funding on the table. I'm not sure if there will be questions from the public on this. O over to you, Director General, uh, if you could be brief, so we also give yes, the chance. I, I will be. I will be brief. Uh, I I would like to con to uh, make a few remarks. I, I agree with uh, Nicole de Moore. We are not the position of the Council and the Parliament are not that far away from each other. So I do think that the most complicated was to get the agreement in the Council in June, then finding an agreement between the two institutions. Uh, uh, Schengen, I think we, it's it's very important because what is at stake here is the very existence of Schengen. We, what was discussed now, and I will not get into the details of that, but yes, there is no solidarity. And because there is no solidarity, 
there is no trust, or maybe it's the uh, the other way around. There is no trust because there is no solidarity. But it's true that at the moment people are not registered. When they enter whatever member states, they are within the uh, the, the rest of Schengen. So what happened is that a number of member states have re re uh, reinstated uh, internal border controls, and this is it, it comes hmm? and even. You know, you hear one or the other country that is ready to uh, to introduce new border control, internal border controls, because uh, they cannot, uh, we cannot control the secondary movements. Because uh, indeed, people arrive in Greece or in Italy or in Spain. You know, when you ask someone at the border, I was in Croatia recently. You ask, where do you want to go? Germany. That's usually the reply. Germany or Sweden, or Belgium, or France, or the UK, but it's rarely the country of first entry. And the country of first entry, if they don't have uh, any support, or they think they have no support, they just let people go. Huh? It's it's not easy, and they can even do it legally. They just give fast asylum procedures, and after that, you are allowed to travel into the EU. And uh, there are also, and I think that's something also we need to, to uh, acknowledge, a court, a constitutional courts that declared Greece or Italy not safe to return uh, people uh, that should be returned according to the Dublin rules. So all that doesn't help. So that's where we need to put some order into that. And that's the purpose of the pact, to have clear rules in terms of um, uh, entering the EU and also clear rules and I come on the procedures. It's not normal that someone asks for asylum in in three, four different countries. So with the new with the pact, this will not be possible anymore because people immediately when someone will ask for asylum in Belgium, you will see because he will have <laughs> or she will have been registered at the external border, you will see that uh, this person should not be, and you will have the possibility to do much faster procedures to return this person. Uh, I'm not saying this will be a perfect system, but it will be much better than what we have today. And on the enforcement of the rules, yes, I agree, it is important that, first of all, we accompany, and uh, to reply to uh, what uh, Fabian Keller was saying, uh, large part, we have funding to help member states to build reception capacities to improve their asylum system. We have uh, two funds for that. We have one for the border management, one for the asylum systems in general, and we have an even another one for the security measures, which is smaller. So these funds will be there to help. And in the review of the new uh, multi-annual financial of the multi-annual financial framework. We have also asked for additional money, but that will depend on the member states to agree on that. We've asked for additional support to help the implementation of the pact, to be allowed to help member states to finance the cost of measures that were not foreseen at the moment when we had uh, designed the MFF for the current seven years of its implementation, and in particular for the border procedure. And then the last question, which we, even if member states, the, the contrary to what uh, Poland and Hungary pretends, migration is not, uh, doesn't require unanimity. So it's Q&I majority. And if there is a majority to adopt the pact, the measures that are in the pact will have to be enforced, including in countries that do not want to, didn't want to have it. So this is the rule of the EU. So we will enforce these rules, and that will be for, for the Commission to make sure that the, uh, the, the implementation of the pact is done everywhere in the EU, because this is how we function. Thank you. Thank you for the clear answer. And then happy to move uh, then to the Q&A session. I have quite a few questions in the chat, but I'm sure that there are also questions here from the audience. So I'm going to take two questions. I think there is a question from the gentleman here and also one in the back. And then I will read one question from uh, the persons connected online. I'd be grateful if you could be brief and also introduce yourself when posing the question. Yes. Um, hi, uh, my name is Emmanuel Ochiri. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Advisor on Migration for the European Network Against Racism. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, 
as a migrant, um, as someone who is not European, um, I can't, I have to be blunt, I have to say that some of the things I hear are frankly shocking. Um, I have to put it that way. And I think that we also have to discuss the elephant in the room and that um, the migration pact is basically um, a pact which seeks to address um, or which seeks to keep a certain group of people outside of Europe, racialized people. I think that this is never really mentioned. I think it's really important to um, to highlight that. And and the question I, I really have for, um, I think for um, our panelists is, um, when I when I did my my doctoral studies, um, we had this procedure, right, um, where I would sit with my colleagues and would perhaps come up with solutions that have nothing to do with reality, and we think that well, this is absolutely amazing because we agreed on it. And I really wonder whether a lot of the proposals that have been put in the pack really have to do with reality. Because if you speak to anyone who is in who works in the NGO sector, who works with migrants, who works with refugees, you actually see that these things are not realistic. They are not going to change. Um, 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 um. No, I mean the solutions that were made um, or the proposals that are made in the pack, which have been defended um, by um, Nicole de Moore, but also by Monique Ampariat. I think that they really have nothing to do with reality. I'm talking of things um, such as the um, accelerated border procedures. I'm talking of things like the crisis um, mechanism um, proposal. And, and I really wonder whether at the end of the day, the policymakers actually do consult with people who actually work with this files on the ground or whether these are just political compromises that are made by politicians and political parties because they want to stay in office. Because I hear um, that there is a crisis, but no, it's not, it's not a migration crisis. We have a crisis of courage. We have a crisis of leaders who have forgotten what it means or what European values mean. I think it's really important that we really reflect on these questions as um, as um, as policymakers, because when I look at the pack as a migrant, thank, thank you. It's 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 absolutely horrible. I'm sorry, I have to say it, it's absolutely horrible. And I'm not, and I can't believe that we have to discuss about it um, 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 in today's Europe. Thank you for your clear question. And if you would like to bring the microphone behind, in the meantime, I will read one question from uh, one of our uh, attendees online, which is, I think, pertinent in this sense. The question concerns the asylum procedures that, as you were saying, importantly, we try to distinguish between persons fleeing from violence and those instead uh, uh, are uh, seeking economic opportunities, but the question is also that it's rather clear cut. It's not as clear cut this division, and so uh, there may be persons who will fall uh, between the cracks. And so perhaps also uh, to give uh, also a substance to this question uh, in relation to this, and then the question from the back. Thank Hello. you for introducing yourself and keep it it short. Hello everyone, I'm Eleonora Vasquez, a journalist from your active covering migration, I have a two question. One about the possibility to introduce instrumentalization in the crisis management. Uh, I, I, I have a question about the legal basis of, of this, like uh, if uh, there is a, a provisional agreement uh, and the instrumentalization in its, is inside, uh, uh, do you think this can pass the legal check? Because according to international law, uh, any uh, person, any third country national can apply uh, for asylum while in the EU soil. And this is uh, uh, pretty serious uh, in the EU legislation. And my second question is, uh, where do you see the balance between secondary movements and the Dublin system? Because what I see then in the reality, uh, I see a lot of possibility for the smugglers to use the, uh, I, know, I know the reality of the council and the difficulties of the legislation on that has happened in the previous legislation. But having said that, how do you see a, a balance between secondary movement and the Dublin system? Because according to that, it's uh, it's very hard to imagine how uh, how there can be a balance according to the but maybe I'm wrong but I'm happy to 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 know your opinion about that. It, the balance is like when uh, um, a person arrives, for example, in Italy and has to apply for international protection in Italy and cannot and and may, for example wants to go to germany okay but cannot go to germany because von der leyen said many times to disincentivize secondary movements so this kind of to create a lot of pressures anyway to to the to the birds or maybe i'm wrong this is just my impression thank you so much 
Um, so I'm going to ask our speakers to be as telegraphic as possible. No, these are difficult questions, and maybe we can start with the first two questions uh, together with uh, Nicole. And if you'd like, Ms. Keller, uh, over to you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, the first question, I, I do not agree at, agree at all. This is not the aim of the pact. We do not at all want to keep a certain group out. And we need uh, to organize also legal migration. Legal migration for reasons of work or study, legal pathways for people are, that are in need of protection. It's not the same. You have on the one hand legal migration for people that, that will come and, and work or study at our university. And at the, the other end, it's legal pathways for people that are in need of protection through humanitarian visa, through uh, resettlement, uh, for example. Uh, we also, in the pact, defend and, and uh, keep the right to asylum uh, existing. Uh, aside from the legal pathways and the legal migration, there will always be a right to ask for asylum for people who arrive at our borders and are in need of protection. This is crucial. This is crucial in the pact. There is a right to asylum, and that's that we we can never uh, give up on on that. And so, yes, we want to take measures against irregular migration, but not against migration. It's not not that the goal is not at all to limit migration, but to organize it in a controlled way. So I do not agree at all that the aim is to keep a certain group out. The aim is to organize migration also for them, but in a in a regular and organized way. Thank you very much for the brief answer. And then Ms. Keller for you on the APR, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, I, I want really to support your answer, Mrs. Minister. Uh, and tell you that uh, I think we have included in the uh, text accelerated procedure. Actually, I would have preferred the word, the wording well-organized procedures. I consider that people staying in procedure one year, one year and a half or two years without, before having a decision are not well treated. We want to install well-organized procedures. And the fact it people stay and stay not knowing what they are going to become is terrible for them because they don't know if they can project themselves, their families or themselves individually in a new world or if they are going to be returned. So uh, I am trying to go on the, on the ground as you do probably in all the European countries, more in the first uh, countries of first century. And my feeling is that the existing system is not satisfying at all. But of course, in these procedures, checks and balances is our reflex. So if they are accelerated, we ask for legal support immediately for the unaccompanied to represent it. It's another security. But they will never, uh, they will be excluded for, from accelerated procedure. And to have human rights checks that are more efficient. Uh, but not separated in the different steps of the procedure more trans, um, discussed and uh, managed in a transversal way. Concerning the people uh, flying violence, the question in the um, chat versus uh, looking forward for, for a job. Looking for a job is not a crime. We can, I mean, sometimes you have to say some evidences. Uh, so it, it's very respectable and those young people take risk for that, for, for their life. But the issue you said it, Monique, before is to organize labor migration. And this is not organized at all at the European level. The, the member states are doing it, but we can be much more transparent in our strategy and explain it to the countries of origin also, have a, um, a clear message about uh, this. Thank you. And then really, yeah, very sure very short because I, I mean, I could only repeat what, what was said. And indeed, uh, uh, I think the, um, I would like to maybe mention one figure. When we talk about irregular migration, which is usually what we talk all the time, it's uh, last year we had 300,000 uh, 300, people more or less that came to the EU. We have more than 3 million every year of people that are granted uh, a work permit or, or even a long-term residence in the EU. 
So there are many more people that come to the EU very regularly to work, to study, to uh, join the, their family. We don't talk about them because it, it functions well. Mm? So this is what we need also to repeat. Uh, and that's the, the way to get to the EU is not to ask for asylum if you are looking for a job. So that's why we have to find different ways to do that. And I would like to correct one thing on the instrumentalization. We never, the instrumentalization doesn't foresee any waiver of the right to ask for asylum. It's, it just foresees that in some specific cases, uh, the uh, right to ask for asylum is limited to one border point, but there is no proposal in the instrumentalization a proposal we put on the table to waive completely the right to ask for asylum. It's just to, in, in case of targeted uh, influx of migrants that are pushed to the border, as we saw in, uh, in Belarus a year and a half ago, that uh, we should be able to help the member states to protect its border, because we also need to allow member states to protect their borders. So it's to find this balance, which is very difficult to find, between the protection of the border, which is a right and, 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 a, and a duty of all member states, and at the same time, being able to provide asylum to people who are, are in need of asylum. And that remains even in the instrumentalization proposal. So I think the point on uh, and on secondary movement versus uh, Dublin, uh, the um, uh, I didn't quite get the the. Uh, we have yes, that's right. We have in the pact proposed new criteria. You know, the Dublin criteria, contrarily to what people think, it is by default the country of first entry, that is. But if you have family, can demonstrate you have family in another country, this will be this country that will be the country that should treat your request. And we have proposed in the AMR to extend that to siblings and to uh, diplomas. So if you have studied in Germany, you Germany should be the place where you could ask for asylum. But uh, this hasn't been retained by the Council so far, by the Parliament, so this is still under discussion, and we will see what comes at the end of that. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. I am afraid we are already uh, at 2.30, uh, so I won't be able to collect more questions, but this is just yet yeah, another step in the conversation, and there will be more opportunities for continuing this discussion. before. Uh, concluding the event, I would like to invite Jean-Louis de Brouwer, uh, the director of the European Affairs uh, Program at the Egmont Institute for offering his final reflection. And just a reminder for everyone else who's in the room, there will be some refreshment and some food too uh, in the adjacent room after the conclusion of this event. So you may also want to pose your questions directly uh, or continue the conversation then. Jean-Louis, over to you. All the more reason for me to be brief. Uh, Madame Kelly, was there from the very beginning. I arrived late uh, because I was until five to one uh, sending quietly emails from my desk. All of a sudden, a colleague popped into my office and asked me, are you not at the event? And all of a sudden, I realized that it was starting at one and not at two, as I had initially thought. Uh, so, but being said, I, I, I think that I almost, I did not miss anything. Uh, I would start by quoting you, State Secretary. You said, uh, we have a unique opportunity. I would say you have a last chance uh, because, I mean, uh, with the Commission proposal, the EU has been pushing until its ultimate limit the search for solution to issues and problems that has been with us for more than 20 years. Nothing new under the sun. Everything was there 20, 25 years ago. Everything was there since we had Schengen. You said it yourself. So it's a, bit, it's a bit of a break or deal moment. And most probably the break or deal will arrive in the next few weeks. Uh, now, the two issues win. Uh, either there is an agreement. Everybody will go to the press, you first, State Secretary, saying, hooray, we have a pact. But then the EU will have to cope with two challenges expectations management 
and deliver a gap. Expectations management. Monique said it, and I'm very glad that you mentioned that, Monique. This will not enter into force until at the earliest, the end of 2025. During the next two years, the migration clock will not stop. And there will be more Lampedusa. There will be more Greek island. There will be more Canary Island. What then will the political elite say? It's very easy for the time being when somebody at a national level has a major migration problem. But we need this fact at European level. There you have it. Why do you still have a problem? Look at the ongoing debate, Lampedusa. But we have this wonderful memorandum of understanding with Tunisia. And still people do come. So there will be an expectation management there. There will be also, the EU will have to confront a classical issue which has nothing special, which is by no means specific to migration field, which is the delivery gap in all policy areas. Delivery gap. You said it yourself, Monique. Uh, I think that initially the concept of the Commission was a good concept. It was about, I mean, enhancing the capacity at the border, improving solidarity mechanism. That was all in there. Maybe the initial proposal was a little bit too complex, but there was a round of consultation. And I think that the commission wanted really to have as many member states on board from the very beginning. I always remember the sentence of Commissioner Johansson when the pact was presented. We hope that it will not be rejected immediately by member states. So it works. But this being said, all along the negotiation, what was initially a rather complex but still to be understood construction became even more complex by the day because of the successive compromises that were proposed by the presidency and because of the compromises which have to be found now in the framework of the trilogue. Uh, I not in the trilogue room, but neither in the council, by the way, <laughs> thanks God. Uh, but uh, I would say that the word constructive ambiguity becomes now what leads all the negotiators which means that you will end up with a set of very complex texts. You said it yourself, Monique, probably with gaps, including legal uncertainties, to put it mildly, and all that will have to be dealt with. All the more than, okay, clearly we have nowadays already member states not doing what they should be doing, but what is going to happen when they will have to deliver on something which is even more complex than that? I do remember in our old days, a few years after the uh, commoditization of the Dublin uh, Convention, we performed inside the good old symbol Dublin system, we performed inside the Commission uh, evaluation of Dublin. We came to the view that the initial Dublin system was not cost effective. It was not cost effective. We did not say anything about it being unfair. We said it was not cost effective. But of course, the outcome of this analysis was stuck at the time simply because Politically, the very concept of Dublin was badly needed, and it was out of question to get rid of the very concept of Dublin. But similar debate might be on the horizon. Now, okay, now that I'm joining the wonderful world of things anchor, those who are not in the council or in a parliament meeting room, I have to ask the question, what if? What if there is no agreement? What if there is no agreement? Or what if a couple of member states you name them, say, okay, you may agree to everything at qualified majority. We are not going to play ball. We are simply not going to play ball. Uh, so that means that we have to th seriously think in terms of what if. One solution is the one that you mentioned, uh, State Secretary. That is to say, let's hope that there will be adults in the room, that they will understand that, after all, we are not back to square one, that there is, after all, a huge EU migration and uh, an asylum aki, and that delivering better on what exists could already be an answer as such to this question, which remains open. Uh, if there is no such uh, common understanding, then the Pandora's box is open. Uh, will there be a chance for the next commission to come with new proposal in case of a failure? I agree with your nodding. No, it's going to be over. Because we have to bear in mind that during the second semester of next year, another major debate will begin, and that's a debate about the future of Europe where a certain number of questions or notions like differentiated integration, repatriation of competences to member states will be on the horizon. So that, I think, is something that we have to bear in mind about the future. It is a break or deal moment. It is not a break or deal moment that will arrive 
in January of next year. It is a break or deal moment that will take place in the next few weeks. But if there is no break, then, sorry to be on the pessimistic side, I hope, I sincerely hope that there will be a break, notwithstanding the challenges that I mentioned earlier. If there is no, if there is not a break, then we're going to have to start ourselves asking very serious questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Louis. Well, we have no choice, but we have to uh, You can reply in front of a cup of coffee. I want to thank everyone for attending, both those in the person and those online. Sorry again for finishing a bit late, but I'm sure that there was enough reflections for all of you. Thank you to our speakers for accepting the invitation. And I also want to personally thank Marina Grama and Anastasia Carazzas from EPC who have uh, managed to uh, persistently uh, help out over the months, over the past months to make this event happen. Thank you all and please make your way through uh, to the adjacent room for some coffee.